Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking's King's bi-weekly podcast. I'm here with Fine Woodworking King creative director, Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Associate editor, Anissa Capsalis. Hello. And World Cup champion, Jeff Rose. <laughs> hey. Good job, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks. I'm your host, Ben Strano. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. You can also use the Voice Memo app on your phone and email us a 30-second audio recording. Or if you're old school, you can leave us a voicemail by calling 203 203- 304-3456. Any links or articles we mention will be on this episode's show notes page, which can be found at shoptalklive.com. Lastly, if you're watching on YouTube, please have some faith in us and preemptively click that thumbs up button, which people did last time. Cool. Hey, here's something. What? Uh, shameless name drop. <laughs> oh, no, it's coming. <laughs> I was wondering. Uh, last night, I had the pleasure of dining with Toshio Odate. Ooh. Who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, who's an awesome woodworker. He's actually an awesome and fairly well-known fine artist and that he's shown in the Guggenheim and the Whitney and he was friends with Arthur Miller and a bunch of artist people. That's not why I'm... Anyway, we know him because he wrote a book um, on Japanese woodworking tools and most most folks I know know him as a woodworker and he is a fantastic woodworker. Um I didn't know that he was an artist outside right. of woodworking. No. Yeah, and he also was like taught sculpture at SUNY Purchase, at Cooper Union, at Pratt for like 35 years. Hmm. So there you go. That's not why I mentioned that though. <laughs> no, this is, is really cool because um, we were talking about furniture and stuff and he's 88 years old and he's embarking on a really ambitious project, kind of a Tonsu style stacking you know, cabinet with a base and a tall piece, huge piece. But the really cool thing is he was talking about how he makes his furniture with the intention of it lasting, he said, oh, three or 400 years. It's like, <laughs> okay. I mean, a lot of us, we kind of, for some reason, we have that 200 year bar for some reason. I make I, this I, to I last have no such bar. <laughs> 200 years, I don't know. <laughs> but um, his take on it was, was this in that, um, he says, because it takes, he says it takes about 200 years for a piece of furniture to really sort of come into its own and develop that patina of use um, that really sort of makes it its ideal in that he basically, he says the, the job of the craftsman is just to make something really good, you know, to the best of your abilities. Um, but then it's really the generations that come after the maker makes it, who uses a piece and puts it to use, that sort of creates, you know, that final surface, that final finish of use from, you know, the rounded over edges, the polished edges. Um, he says, he kind of explained it as the maker can only do so much and it's really up to the generations of people that follow to kind of finish the piece for him. And he equated building a piece of furniture with planting a tree. And mm -hmm. that he'll never actually see it finished, but you don't plant a tree for yourself. You plant trees for the generations to follow. And to sort of equate that with building a piece of furniture was really, really cool. Yeah. that I don't know if I, A, have that much faith in my pieces lasting two or 300 years, but or B, could be that selfless in making them. Yeah. I mean, of course, we've all had the experience where one of your kids like immediately scratches the <laughs> table you made or something like that. And Toshio Adate would just look at that and say, well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you're on your way. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he talked about, you know, the small repairs that get made on pieces of furniture. That just adds to that whole thing. Hmm. And that, you know, you never, you know, for a lot of us, it's like, oh, I want to strip and refinish this old piece of furniture. It's like, well... What are you trying to do? Because you're never going to make it look new again. And all you're doing is destroying any sort of patina of age and use that has been developed over these years. And you're going to end up with something which is just not good. So that neat. that's, that's kind of neat. I like the idea of acknowledging that my pieces are going to age. They're going to get old eventually in that, you know, hopefully building in a way that they'll age gracefully. But he sort of took it to the next level and said, it doesn't even really come into its own for a very, very long time. Hmm. So there you go. Kind of like people. Yes. <laughs> Maybe some people. I'm hoping in 200 years they 
they realize what what <laughs> what what I had going on. <laughs> We realize now, Ben. Sure. We get it. <laughs> I um I met Toshio Adate at one of the Furniture Society conferences. Oh, cool. And he was doing a, a presentation on on planing wood. And he had all his hand planes out and he had this big slab and he turns around. And he bends down behind where nobody could see, and he's getting something out of his box, his beautiful toolbox, pulls out a power planer and goes down <laughs> on that board. It was so great. It was so fantastic. And he talked about, you know, where to use power tools and where to use hand tools. Cool. And it was it was really, really spot on. It was a good it was a really surprising, irreverent, but yet very Practical approach. Approach yeah. to things. <laughs> <laughs> approach to to share yeah. with everybody yeah, because so. the expectation when everybody was sitting there looking at him was we were going to watch him use hand tools sure. for two hours, and so it was it was really really beautifully done. Yeah, we have a we have a video of uh, Chris Bexford doing dovetails, and you know he pulls out the. The sander, the um, oh, the belt sander, the belt yeah. sander <laughs> halfway through, and most of the comments are like, "That was a big f you to whoever right there," and, and he had a little bit of a smirk on his face when, when uh, he, he did. Always it. Does. <laughs> he loves doing that. He has that little jig holder thing, which is too, genius. That, yeah. Which is really genius that he puts the box on. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, the well. And the other thing that Toshio has done is he's, I think he partnered with DMT, the diamond plate people, to create some specially hollowed out diamond plates in order to impart a camber on his like power Matt planer mentioned plates. mentioned this at lunch or something. Huh. So, so there's, there's a camber to his power planer. Yeah. And the point being... So you don't leave plane tracks from your power planer as you're planing these surfaces. Okay. And could, also, if you go, you know, with a blade sort of, you know, perpendicular to the sides, you get the maximum amount of camber. But then as you skew the blade, as you sharpen it, the camber becomes longer and more subtle. So it's a variable camber system for your wow. power planer blades. So. so as you're sharpening them in the cambered stone, you yeah. skew it. If you want to skew it for less camber, you can do that for heavier cuts. Keep it straight on for a for deeper camber. Dang. Yeah, I know. So. Pretty cool. I have no Toshio Dante stories. Wow, that's too bad. You yeah. can make one up. We wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> I I will do no such thing. I mean, so that would be irreverent. <laughs> I never actually saw him at the Furniture Society. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Mike, you did actually have dinner with Toshio Dante. Uh, <laughs> because we got the text messages bragging that you were... <laughs> yes. It's the best thing about working at a woodworking magazine is there are people you can tell um, in order to, like, ruin their days. <laughs> yeah, Barry didn't take it well. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should we uh, start with some questions? Sure. All right. Question number one is from Greg. I have a small job site table saw, and after your recommendations, I've invested in a bandsaw so that I can make that the primary tool for many of my cuts. I have a sharp 3 TPI blade and have followed Michael Fortune's articles on setting up my bandsaw, but I'm less than impressed with the cut quality I'm getting. I understand that there will always be some amount of cleaning up regardless of the tool, but is there supposed to be such a difference between a table saw and a bandsaw? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think they're... A table saw you can kind of get... Not a finish ready surface off of but close to it the closest you're going to get to it yes yeah um i mean i think it varies depending on your bandsaw blade some blades leave really really clean cuts it depends on your bandsaw is there any run out in the tires or flutter in the blade whatsoever i've seen bandsaw cuts which are just like wow this looks like it just came off a joiner or something but for me that's that's more of a exception than a rule. John John Benson had an off cut from a Brian Boggs article. Well, his there desk. you go. And it was like, what? Wait, because it was a curved piece. It was like, no, this is spoke shaped or something, right? Yeah. And he's like, nope, that's straight off the bandsaw. Yeah. 
Um, I, I do expect to be able to get a joint quality surface from a bandsaw. Like I, I'll cut tenon cheeks yeah. with a bandsaw often, and that will be my fit surface. So it might have a little bit you know, heavier score marks, but um, with a good sharp blade and your fence adjusted right and a really nice slow feed rate, I think you can do very, very accurate work with a bandsaw, but just typically not that final surface you're going to get from a table saw. What about? Do you feel the same way about? Because I, I don't, I don't think I could get a joint quality surface off my bandsaw currently. I agree with Mike. I think that you can. Um, you, I've never seen anything that's as close to a table saw as the yeah. Brian Boggs thing that you're talking about. Um, I think that slow feed rate might be yeah. key too. When I was at Nancy Hiller's a couple months ago, she was doing a curve for um, uh, should be out any day now. Uh, a little a wall cabinet that she does. It's an architectural cabinet and has a curve on the front. And I was shooting it, and I thought that she was moving very slowly for my benefit, mm -hmm. and. I realized afterward that she was just slowly feeding through to get the curve, to get the finish line, and it was really close to almost perfect. Yeah. She did go over and, and smooth it out afterward, but that slow feed rate is key. So it was, it was even slower than you are used to. Yeah. Yeah. She was very methodical, very slow. I think some of it was for my benefit. Uh, taking the photographs, but it, it came out with a really nice surface, a really nice cut. I've I've mentioned it before, but uh, you know, Chris Gochner sawing a tenon by hand. It was like I I couldn't believe how slow he was going. But then when it fit off the saw, yeah, it was that was the fastest way of doing it right there. <laughs> so yeah, I I maybe slow slow down, Greg uh, and Ben. Uh, I feel like I I might be pushing through cuts too too hard too fast on the band saw. Um, also, it depends on the bandsaw. I think you have my old bandsaw, do you not? No. Who's got that one? Not it. Oh, it, I sold mine to Matt, and then he sold it to somebody else. I, I think Ed. Ed. We're, and we're different people, Mike. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Very. laughs> I had a Delta 14-inch bandsaw, and I just considered that to be sort of a rough cutting tool. Like you just kind of get there, you you know, your curve is going to be only so close. You're going to do a lot of cleanup. When I switch to a, a little better built saw, I can put a wider blade on there, intention it a little bit more properly. I definitely treat it much more as a sort of a fine cutting saw. Um, and I do think that of all my skills that have probably improved the most in the last few years, it's probably cutting to a curve on the bandsaw. It's not easy. No, but if you have the right tool, and to your point, Anissa, um, if you sort of take your time and really sort of work on your technique and the care you take, you can become really, really accurate with it. And maybe not that band, I mean, that table saw quality surface, but if it's really, really true, you can just, you know, clean up a curve really quickly with a spoke shape or something. And you're not trying to fare this wonky, wobbly curve after the fact. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, guess here uh, for each of you, you do a rip on the table saw, you do a rip on the band saw. How many passes with a hand plane are you going to give the table saw versus the band saw? That's the only way that I can think of actually, you know, giving a, a, a solid calculated answer between what you should be expecting between the two. One versus three. That's a good answer. Wow. Okay. So closer than I'm getting. Apparently. <laughs> Either that or Nisa's hand plane is set really heavy. <laughs> Which I'm You're sure just talking not. about a straight rip, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you should be able to plane off a bandsaw. I mean, it's it's not that radically different, the surface yeah. that you're getting. Okay. It shouldn't be. As long as the blade isn't wandering and you're not having to account for big humps in their yeah. cut. Yeah. All right. Well, there, there's a there's a number for you, Greg. Let's let's see uh, see how you fare compared to Anissa. <laughs> All right. Question number two is from Eric. I'm a 13 year veteran welding and auto mechanics teacher, about to take on my first wood shop. 
I assume Woodshop program. What skills would you like students to exit a three-year secondary program with? Also, what are the most important skills to teach a beginning woodworker? This, this is this is a heavy one. Is this high school? What is that? Three-year program. Secondary. Yeah, what is that? So that's secondary post ed. high school probably yeah like like i know around here um my dad went to danbury high for all four years and then went to Abitech to study to be an electrician yeah so it's it's definitely it sounds like they are focused on that one thing okay but high school level like a tech school would you say post high school i'd say yeah tech school I'm not sure. Because I, I, I wouldn't call it wood shop at the college level. And secondary program could also be secondary <laughs> ed, which is like 7th through 12th. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure. That changes the curriculum, right? Maybe. Maybe not. I think it's different. And if, um, if you're talking about a three-year program at the high school level, I think that would be different than, say, a three-year program at North Bennett or College of the Redwoods, which are really two-year programs, in which case you're building stunning, stunning furniture after those two years. I think high school, the expectation um, is a little bit different. And I would also think, especially if this is at the high school level, um, you know, the goals might be different because if you're going to North Bennett or College Redwoods, you're taking a big jump into really wanting to not make money as a furniture maker. <laughs> At the high school level, um, it's possible that, you know, you're maybe looking towards a career. Yeah. Um, so which case means if you're going to really make a living at it, you're probably working with CNC machines, mm -hmm. um, using sheet goods, in doing like a lot of built-in work or conference tables or office work or kitchens, um, which is a whole different skill set. Yeah. But I think a little of each is probably a good thing. I'd say um, a really good grounding in basic hand tools, basic drafting, uh, basic machine work, and then as much as you can get on the tech side in terms of programming, CNC, you know, really because, I mean, that's the future yeah. of things. And I know... I made it sound like that's like the the horrible reality of it, but I, I think any technology is just another tool. Mm -hmm. You learn to use it and incorporate that into what you're doing, and I think it just empowers you to do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I think that probably if um, if we talk to Steve Lada, who runs that A Stevens, yeah. which is you know post high school, it's a, it's a it's a tech school, right? It's a is it part of a college? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Stevens College. Mm -hmm. Duh. <laughs> but um, I feel like Steve and his program, they're really geared towards, hey, you graduate here, you're going to be able to put food on the table. Yes, yeah. Um, that's a really important thing. And his students make stunning pieces. They make, you know, if you follow them on Instagram, uh, there's always a time of year when it's like the students are finishing up their programs. Yes. And... And they're, you know, showing off their spice boxes and their their hunt boards and all sorts of beautiful pieces. Yes. But when you talk to somebody like Greg Pilati, who graduated from Thaddeus Stevens, those guys also know how to program a CNC. Yes. Those guys know how to run a drafting program. They know how to do production work. They know how to run a business, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's, there's there's a difference there. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you you went to College of the Redwoods. So what? That was a two year program you went to. It could be one or two. And I she's went one. Now an editor at Woodworking Magazine. So, so there you yeah, go. that went south. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one way of looking at it. Certainly. <laughs> um, I think jumping back to Steve Lada, I think their school, his school, is a good model. Yeah. Um, for what it seems this guy is doing, um, Eric, right? Yeah. Um, I would add that I think sharpening hand tools, but really sharpening the hand tools is one of the major things to get in there. And machine maintenance, not just how to use the machines, the, mm -hmm. but uh, how to maintain point. the machines, right. 
how to tune them up. Um, have like a, a, a maintenance schedule, probably. I don't, yeah. I haven't gotten that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, if those machines are running all day long. Yeah, you know, no, that's it, a really good point. Yeah. Um, I know uh, um, Matt Wada talks about a maintenance schedule that is like programmed into yeah. uh, North Bennett that's Street right. and some, some other places that, that he goes and does maintenance for. And it's like every two months, shut down the shop, tune it up. Wow. You know, yeah. um, that's definitely something to think yeah. about. I think yeah. some of the schools are lacking that. Um, but in three years, you can cover a lot. They should be able to come out of that program and do pretty much anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three years is a long time. So that's a lot of pressure, Eric. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, teach him some welding while you're at it. Yeah, it makes well, me it. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah he's a... Welding teachers. And so. probably some auto mechanics too, because you're not going to be able to afford to have your car fixed. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but there's, there's, I mean, the welding thing is a really good point. It's like, again, you look at a guy like Greg Pilati, I think he has a welder yeah. working at his shop, building table bases. And if you can teach your students to do that themselves, they're going to be more self sufficient, yeah. which is a great thing. So, um, Teaching a beginning woodworker, like like you said, sharpening and measuring and laying out and things like that. But yeah, let us know more specifics, Eric, and let us know what you wind up coming up with with a curriculum because what you've got going on. And then we can just edit down this to the answer he was looking for. Yeah, <laughs> I'll just have I'll just have a uh, Google Translate read it <laughs> in three different voices. <laughs> And if it's high school or post high school. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think it's now time to talk about our all time favorite technique of all time for this week. Who wants to start? Go ahead, Anisa. Were you able to? You told me that there was an Instagram video. Yeah. And that's the extent of the information you gave me. Oh, Can you I post see. someone's Instagram video? I said, maybe. And that's the last I heard. Oh, shoot. I <laughs> sent it to you on Instagram. Oh, yeah. yeah and okay. you probably, yeah, I should have told you that I sent it to you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike some staff members, I'm not on Instagram all day at my desk. <laughs> well, I'm not either, but <laughs> since I, I told you, I was sending it. The number of followers actually show that, Ben. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that reflects my woodworking skills and photo <laughs> photography <laughs> ability. <laughs> so the link I sent you, I have two. I have one very simple technique that I really like. I really like for cutting wedges, whether like wedging tenons or <clears throat> if you're using – I found out that there were times when I need a ton of wedges. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm gluing up and I use them to put pressure on two veneers that I'm gluing together. Um, and you just cut a little notch in a sled – for the bandsaw, a little diagonal. Like if this were, I'm <laughs> right, gonna, drawing it on right. the paper for both of us is not going to do Well, no, anything. I'm going to hold it up after. So what? This is and like the a, audio <laughs> listeners. Will, <laughs> so it's like on the it's edge a little, of a piece of plywood, or anything yeah, like on the edge of a little piece of plywood or a piece of wood, and you just slot another piece of wood in and run it against the fence, and you get perfect wedges every time. Mm -hmm. It's super easy, really fast and efficient. And um, that reminded me of something that I keep going on about because I was so impressed by this Instagram video that Philip Morley posted where Thanks. he has he has that shoot off yeah. his table saw where all yeah. those little offcuts are coming. And uh, I thought you could post that, but I, I, I blew it. I, I Tell you what, we will not only post it, we will repost it on Instagram. Oh, brilliant. Um, it's so did, simple. Did, so did, did Philip have the wedge? Was post he making as well? wedges? No. Oh, okay. The wedge post is or the wedge idea. I don't know where I got it, but it's fun to do too. It's really yeah. How do you uh, make up your wedge stock? How do I make up the wedge stock? Yeah. Just the little boards that I grab out of the bin, or if I <laughs> actually, you know, you'll thickness it to where you want it, and then zip it through. It's just tiny little blocks. And do, like, like I know, like uh, Michael Fortune has 
buckets full of wedges uh, of varying angles and everything? Do you just like when when you go to make wedges, how many are you making up? Depends. If I'm, you know, gluing a long veneers together and I need a couple pairs all the way down, you know, 10, 20. Um, it, and I don't keep the little sled or jig hanging around. I just chuck it afterward, which I guess I should keep it sitting around, but it's so quick and easy to make. That yeah. I just do it on the spot. Michael has one that that is, I think it's got five different angles in the one sled. All right. It looks oh, like a little a sled. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. a good idea just to have that one kicking around. Yeah. So it's like, if you don't have anything to do right now, why don't you go make some wedges? <laughs> <laughs> reason why I asked that, Anissa, is because I'll use wedges for tenons on occasion. There's specific thicknesses, whether it's half inch, three eighths. Um, and so I'll mill up stock to that thickness. And, you know, obviously the idea is that then you're sort of taking cross cuts off the end of that stock because as you make your wedge, they need to be with the grain and not against the grain. Right. So you're flipping that board. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a bunch of... Um, when I do wedges, say, for three-eighths, I'll definitely make a lot more wedge stock than I need for what I have. And I just drill a hole in along one edge of my stock of all the pieces and just sort of hang them on a screw by my bandsaw so I can just pull them out, make my three-eighth inch wedges. That's a good idea. Right on. So, there you go. I didn't hear any of that. I just hear the lawnmower outside the <laughs> studio right now. <laughs> it's killing me. Uh, Mike, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. This is something I'm, I'm sure I talked about this in the past, but I'm getting ready to uh, teach at Mark Adams next week. We're doing a Krenov style case on stand. And um, my favorite technique of all time of the week has to do with creating some really, really subtle curves on these basically straight tapered legs. Um, I found that when I was making the original piece and I tried to bandsaw a curve into the adjacent outside faces, no matter how subtle I could make that curve. When you viewed it in three sort of 3D um, in real life, it just became really exaggerated. And it was just like, oh, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. So I started out with basically a just a straight taper. And I created the impression of a curve by using a tapered chamfer um, along the outside edge. So where the widest point of the chamfer is, say, maybe um, five or six inches down from the top of the leg. And then it, it sort of tapers out to almost zero at the bottom and then at the top of the leg. And it just creates, as again, as you're looking at this leg at the angle, what you're really seeing is sort of this, those two surfaces left over from that chamfer. And it's a way to impart a really subtle uh, curve to your work and control it really, really precisely. So um, it's the old tapered chamfer. That photo is ridiculously beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> What? Oh, the plane shaving is just sitting there by accident. Huh. How'd that happen? <laughs> it's like you're, you really, you're getting good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm past my prime. That was like a two-year-old shot. I don't, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, I, I did something similar, uh, and I was, I was just thinking about it a couple weeks ago when I made that side table. And it's, it was a deep side table for the for the size of the table. <laughs> I think he's in the stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for him to like, just start staring in the window and <laughs> looking right at me. <laughs> this guy. All right. Well, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's a small side table, but it was deep because I wanted a lot of drawers. And you had mentioned putting like a tapered curve on the bottom of it to lighten up the the sides of it yeah right and um it's funny when when i look at it now i don't even see the curve but i also don't see the heaviness of it there you go yeah it's like i i, I and i i really just remembered that there was a curve i was sitting next to it, i was just looking at the table i was like yeah this is holding up nicely i was like oh yeah i spent god knows how much time i actually practiced doing that tapered curve and um I had totally forgotten about it, but I think it's it did exactly what it, 
I needed it cool. to. Yeah, so. that's another way to cheat, like an arch on the bottom of a rail or, or a drawer stretcher or something. Rather than having to saw that whole curve out, you just do that tapered chamfer on that front bottom corner, and it creates a sense of an arch. Yeah. A lot faster, a lot easier. Yeah. Cool. What you uh, got, babe? Mine is uh, from a Michael Robbins article that's uh, probably just hit newsstands or, or your inbox, whatever, however you get the magazine. And um, at first, I didn't realize how brilliant it was. But basically, I, I looked at this photo real quick, and I see... The red trash can in the background. I didn't see the red trash can in the background. No. I apparently didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, but, everybody. But Michael is uh, drilling a mortise at the drill press in, in a leg, in a round leg. And one of the problems with any operation like that is figuring out your angles. On something round. On something round. Yeah. What is the top? And now what is 90 degrees from that yeah. or whatever? And... Um, I, I quickly just looked and I noticed that he had, you know, it looked like the ruler from his combo square in a kerf cut on the end of the leg. And I was like, that's genius. It's like a winding stick. It exaggerates the, the, the angle that the leg is at and it'll make it more obvious where it needs to be. Um, but then... I'm not joking. I thought that was genius. And then today I pulled up the photo to put in in the in the folder for Jeff and you I realized saw the level. Oh my goodness, this is <laughs> unbelievable. He's got a magnetic level stuck to it. Yes. And so he can just level the table on his drill press or whatever. I guess you shim your drill press so it's level and then stick the the ruler in, stick the level on that. And if it's level or if it's perpendicular, you've got the two bubbles. It, my mind has been so unbelievably blown by this. And it's that's that like Brian Boggs level yeah. stuff where it's like, you're, I'm not going to get there. This is why I need to read articles and watch videos and stuff because that's unbelievable. So That's cool. I have to admit that um, one of my jobs at the magazine when I'm not on Instagram – is um, I worked to, for the together record, I wasn't looking at you <laughs> with the um, editors after a photo shoot, and sometimes you know, Anissa, you'll come back with seven, eight hundred photos, even more than that. You're being mean. No, this is a good thing, <laughs> but and it, it's sort of like an embarrassment of riches in that it's too much of a good thing. You have all these photos out, and we've got six or eight pages in twenty-five to thirty photos to tell this entire process. So. Um, it's really a painful, painstaking process to edit these photos down to be able to tell a story. And in this particular case, it's like, okay, drill press, the table's angled, boom, we got one shot because we have so much more to get through when making this table. And that, so this, everything you're talking about kind of went over my head until later we were looking at the layout and then I actually saw what was going on and then I saw the outs, meaning the photos that didn't make it into the article and I saw now the second shot is this thing with this ruler now the other flat. way. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God. So we ended up like adding a bunch of photos back in after the fact when I, it's like, I was like, oh my gosh, this completely went over my head as well. And once I realized it, it was brilliant. And we were very successfully able to crop out the red trash can. Oh, I was just going to ask you. <laughs> So, That's all I can see now. Yes. Uh, I don't see it at all. So an awesome, awesome article, um, great piece of furniture, great photography uh, by Anissa. Um, really, really cool. And that's one of my favorite things of working is that when something hits you, it's like, oh, my gosh, that just blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, this desk, I've been excited for this article for a long time because um, I remember – I, I thought I was at the at the forefront of this, but it turns out Anissa kind of you you beat me to to the bunch on this. But I remember scrolling through Instagram and seeing him make this desk, and it was like the first shot where it was like you kind of realized what he was doing, and I sent it to like you and Tom and Matt like right away, and everybody was like, "Yes, we need to do an article on that." Yeah. And then it turned out it was like Anissa's like, "Yeah." I'm Dude, on it. I'm, I'm already on, on it, guys. <laughs> I remember it the opposite. I thought it was you that 
No, you had gotten to it before me. You were like, yeah, old news. Oh. <laughs> but it just it validated my, uh, my taste in furniture. He's, or other people's <laughs> taste in furniture, at least. He's fantastic to work with. I mean, he's so well prepared, so calm, so smart in his methods. Yeah. So I have another one coming up with him ebonizing. It's a finishing article. Yeah, cool. So that'll be look, something to look forward to for Michael Robbins. Yeah. I also talked to you which know, trash can will we feature this time? None. <laughs> none. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> that wasn't there when I shot it. I, I promise. Exactly. <laughs> it's amazing how you can get so focused and hooked yes. into yeah. what you're doing and but that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to get the red garbage cans out of the background. Well, Je- yeah. Jeff always, you know, we'll be editing. He'll go, hey, Ben, you see on that wide shot, my tripod leg right there? It's yeah. like, oh, come on. It's like you never see it because you're concentrating on the yeah. task at hand. Yeah. And no one else ever sees it either. Go go Jeff watch <laughs> watch the original Rocky and watch the fight scene and you look at the stands and there's like no one there or yeah. there may even be like paper cutouts or something and you realize they're shooting this entire big fight thing in like in an empty room. It's just like I never noticed that. Oh. How did I not see that? that? Out. So listen to the organ on <laughs> <laughs> on the Beach Boys um, California uh, girls. The organ in the first verse. You'll never be able to unhear it. Huh. Go do it. Okay. Yeah. There you go. What I was saying about Michael Robbins, and, and earlier when I said about not being able to make a living as a furniture maker unless you're doing CNC work, he is actually really successful. Yeah. I think for a lot of good reasons. He is an absolutely fantastic designer, which I think is far more critical skill than learning how to cut a dovetail or sharpen a hand plane or take micro thin shavings. Um, you have to be a good designer. And then he's, like you said, he's really, really smart in terms of building beautiful furniture in a really efficient fashion. And he's doing a good, he's making the work he wants to make and he's successful in selling it as well. So you can do it. If you want to do it, you can do it. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Anissa is going to accidentally spill CA glue all over Mike. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Shop Talk Live is brought to you by Verathane. From furniture and cabinets to floors and crafts, professionals and DIYers alike have trusted the color and protection of Verathane since 1958. Verathane wood stain gives rich, true color in one coat. And Verathane triple thick polyurethane has the durability of three coats in one. Visit verathanemasters.com for details. Hi, I'm Tom McLaughlin, host of Rough Cut with Fine Woodworking, sponsored in part by Felder Group and SCM. Season 8 is now airing on PBS and brings unusual, unique design inspiration and easy-to-follow project instruction to woodworkers at every skill level. Check your local listings or visit finewoodworking.tv to watch right now. All right, this last question is from Bob. I'm not a very creative person. Most of the things I make are from existing plans. Many times I see a design that I like, but the size is not right. What advice do you have for scaling a piece up or down without messing up the design? This one's tough. But if anyone can answer this one, it's you too. So I would say, Bob, there's no such thing as non-creative people. I think there's only people who don't give themselves credit for having the creativity to do the work they want to be doing. So let's let's dismiss that right there. And number two, if you're working from existing plans and modifying them to something you like, that means you have a vision in your head that you're working towards. And it started with finding a plan that you that got you most of the way there, and now you're taking it the rest of the way through your own tweaks. That's really creative. That's that engineering portion of it. That's designing furniture. That's like a, a really huge portion of it. So you're already doing it. Um, to answer your question in terms of scaling a piece up or down, <clears throat> I would probably say um, rather than just like the overall like length and width of parts to get them bigger or smaller, take into account the thickness of the parts as well. Yeah. Um, because you can have, um, you know, a smaller piece, say a small bookcase where the sides are three quarters of an inch thick and you bring that up quite a bit and all of a sudden that three quarters looks really, really skinny. Oh. 
Um, again, and if you're taking something down to a smaller size, a wall cabinet or something, and you don't reduce the thickness of those parts, it's going to look really heavy and boxy. Um, that would probably be my first thing. And then second thing, mock it up full size, and especially if you're changing not just the scale but the proportions of a piece, making it wider or taller, you're changing a lot there. And just make sure once you make those changes, you still like it. And the only way you can do that before you make the piece is with uh, full-size mock-ups. It's, it's worth the trouble to do that. Yeah. Basically, Mike just said everything I was going to say. Oh. If you... Yeah, yeah. me too. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I go first if I have an answer. <laughs> um, yeah, because if you're, if you're changing those overall dimensions, you are going to have to be careful that the parts aren't too thin or too thick, depending on whether you're going bigger or smaller. Um, and I was going to suggest the mock-up as well because you're not going to know until you start making that and do a mock-up so that you don't make the whole thing in expensive wood and yeah. then hate the dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you can also throw in, if you're working from a scale drawing, you can take those drawings and get them reduced or enlarged um, and go off of those. That's true, yeah. Um and then we have Fine Woodworking has a couple of pretty decent articles about scaling work, N not directly connected. I'm not sure how he's – is he going from drawings or photographs um, or an actual piece of furniture that he saw somewhere? Existing plans, so. Um, You're talking about Miguel's article? No, that's another one. Um, he did an article on how you take a, photo a photograph shot at an angle – and then create a measured drawing from that. Yeah, I forgot cool. about that one. I was thinking of the how they did it f that goes along with the Arian Commission oh. of the Century. Okay. Um, but then Dave Richards also did one. I think it might have just been a blog, not a print article. Yeah. But he talked about getting a photo and using SketchUp. And there's a program called Match Photo where you could put that in and you can use that. Oh, yes. To, right. Dave, uh, I'm pretty sure Dave Richard just uses SketchUp to make his breakfast in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that guy, it, both him and Tim Killen, they, they blog for us on, on SketchUp techniques. And it's it's unbelievable what they're able to do. And he actually does have um, another blog about uh, easily changing. So if, like, if you buy the electronic uh, plans, a lot of times those come with a download of the SketchUp, yes, and he he has plugins and whatnot to change this dimension, but leave this dimension huh. alone or, cool. or whatever. And so, yeah, Dave's stuff is is a fantastic resource. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Good, <laughs> me too. Then, but like, um, we had talked about on an episode of a few episodes back, um, somebody scaling up or down a bed and it was like an arts and crafts bed. Um, yes. what are like, especially arts and crafts, it seems like that would be a dangerous proposition. Like what are elements that you could see going wrong? Um, that's a good, yeah. That last question was about, um, going from a queen size to a king size footboard headboard and stretching that out in one dimension. And that's, that's scary because you do sort of really kind of throw things off a little bit that way. But um, in terms of designing, like within a style, I think one of the most um, valuable things from working from an existing plan is that <clears throat> the maker did a good job of getting the scale of the piece right. Sometimes I, I think that's the most difficult thing is you can have a design that looks really good small on paper, but then you bring it to real life and all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's like giant. How did it get so big? So um, using existing plans for a basic scale, but rather than sort of looking at all the details on the existing plan, um, one way to sort of work your way into designing original work is to just sort of use that to create a basic sense of scale, elements of parts, size of drawers and doors, so you know that it's just going to live in real life in a pleasing way. And then just start to look at design details of the types of furniture you like, whether it's original stuff or you're working from a period. Try to learn as much as you can about the styles that you like so that you can start to apply, you know, the details in a logical fashion to, you know, the basic work you're doing. Because we're really kind of making 
for the most part, rectilinear work and those small details are what sort of gives it um, its, its kind of form and personality. So, It, it reminds me of uh, something that Michael Fortune does where he, you know, he draws the basic shape and then uses tracing paper over it yeah. to draw it 15, 20 yeah. times with all sorts of different little things here and there. And, and um, I, early on, uh, when I came to the magazine, I took a design course with you, mostly to kiss butt. But um, in it, you would, like, because I've never thought of myself as a designer or someone capable of designing furniture and at first, I'm I'm taking this class and I'm drawing things. And it's just like this sucks. This is this, I, this I'm, class I'm, sucks. I'm, <laughs> what a bad teacher! But like I'm I'm horrible at this. And slowly, I realized that you've drawn furniture, or you you've drawn a, a piece of furniture ten thousand times. And at that point, I had drawn a piece of furniture twenty four times. There you go. And I was just nowhere near. As experienced, and but you're not going to get experienced by not drawing furniture, yeah. by not designing furniture. So um, it's something that I struggle with, is like you know having the guts to draw draw a piece and then build the piece, as opposed to building something that you know looks good. Um, so for me, I I, I do both. Um, I'll try and design a piece, and then I'll I'll download a plan and build something that's known that my family can sit around and eat dinner on and I'm not going to sit there and hate the design. Right. Um, but if you want to get better at designing, you, you got to do more of it. Yeah. And I think building existing designs is a really good exercise in becoming better as a designer because I think once you build something, you really get your head into what this person was thinking yeah. when they made it because as you're making it, I think – you know, you really start to understand the decisions they made in terms of construction techniques, which is a huge part of design, as well as proportioning. It's like, wow, this piece is this dimension. It looks so much bigger than the real piece. I'm surprised it's this small. Those sorts of things where you really begin to understand how the components in the piece, the decisions that are made, affect the final look in maybe not a really logical or immediately intuitive way. And you, you notice elements that you might not notice in the finished piece. Yeah, definitely. But um, I remember on the dining table uh, I made that was by Dan Chafin. By Dan, Dan Chafin. Yeah. The leg shape, um, I didn't notice there was a, you know, like a 45 degree bevel on, on the end. I only saw the curve. Yeah. But without that bevel, that curve was not going to work. It was, and, and as you're building it, you can see how he got from, point A to point B yeah. without necessarily seeing or without necessarily knowing the multiple steps that, that were part of it. So it's not, it's not only construction that, that you're learning, but you're, you are getting inside the designer's head to say, Oh, he cut that first. And then that curve naturally comes out of that. And yes. it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Anissa just wrote, edited a great article on design. I was issue. just about to say and she, that. And she's going to mention it right now. <laughs> you can if you want. No, we're, we're, you guys are speaking specifically to the next designer's notebook that's coming out. And um, it talks all about whether you can learn how to be a better designer or if people can teach design and nurture their students along the design process. So you guys touched on a lot of different things and there are four different people weighing in on the topic um, who have a lot of experience designing amazing furniture and they teach woodworking and they teach design. So Hank Gilpin weighs in, Michael Cullen, Laura Mays, and um, I'm forgetting one. Who am Alan, I forgetting? Alan, Alan Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. The best one of the bunch. I know. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, they're all yes. really great. And it's it's fascinating to me to hear them. Uh, Meander is not the, the right word, but I'm going to say that it's it's fascinating to read about the meandering process mm -hmm. yeah. and how, what they think of it and they kind of end up in similar places. Yeah. So it, it's kind of what you guys are talking about and you touched on a lot of 
what they said. Oh my gosh. Which in, you should still read what? the article. In the same issue is an article by Tim Coleman oh, that's on right. his process for design. We couldn't promo this issue. Oh my God. No, this is like. <laughs> we didn't even try. We, I swear, we didn't set out to do this. This is one of my favorite We're articles. Just of all time, probably ever. Actually, we had Tim on the podcast, and he was talking about his design and thing. And this came from And I was that, like, yeah. oh, this has to be an article, um, <laughs> because he comes out of College of the Redwoods, so he's sort of coming out of the tradition of Krenov, who has a very um, a fluid way of sort of designing, which he refers to as composing. But basically, Tim's article, and if you know Tim Coleman's work, he is, I think, one of the very best furniture designers ever around beautiful, beautiful work, but you say, how does this stuff end up this way? And he goes through his process where it starts with sketches and mock-ups. But then as he begins building, he leaves room to continue that refining of the design process. And he's actually still making decisions about the design as he begins to build. And that's the thing that blew me away is you think, well, really good people must know exactly what they want to make. And then they make it. They're two different things, but it's not. I mean, it's not the same as, well, I'm just going to start building. I don't really know what this is yet. He has a really definite idea of where he's going, but he gives himself a little leeway by leaving stock a little heavier where the joints come together or he'll make a table, but then he'll do a mock-up of the stretcher out of cardboard to put it in the real legs. So he's that mock-up process also happens to the design. Anyway, fantastic article. I think it really gets to the heart of a, of a really great design process, which Anissa's Designer's Notebook um, article really sort of speaks to in general terms. Tim says, this is how I go about designing, and it's absolutely brilliant. I... I'm just very proud of us for promoing an issue as well. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, I'm beaming right now. Wait, but this is coming out how it, much after? The, no, uh, this episode will be uh, posted after the issue it's comes up. So the issue, if I do my job correctly, will be coming out the 25th or so. The so is the if I do my job correctly part. Um, but And this uh, episode should be out. Eight days after that. Great. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's let's go over some listener comments on uh, YouTube from WB Fine Woodworking, who's like our superstar, gold star winning commenter on YouTube. Uh, another great podcast. Like Ben, uh, or this is on 167. Like Ben, until I got a planer, all of my work was three quarters of an inch or whatever the thickness of the wood I could get at the hard deal at the hardwood dealer. It's amazing how much that changed after I bought a planer. And after listening to Mike, I'm now going to start saving for some Lee Nielsen or Veritas chisels. Thanks, guys. And uh, hopefully you get a kickback or something for that. I do. Do they send you like a three-inch inch chisel? It's a direct you? deposit. Okay, okay cool. Uh, from Dan Letkman, I have used PVA glue on the field and CA glue in key spots with accelerator on the opposite piece. It works well when you cannot clamp or don't have the patience to wait for the PVA glue to dry, but here, need more here. strength than CA glue provides. So you've done that? Kind of. All right. <laughs> uh, and from Sawdust in My Veins, if a five-star review on iTunes, which we really, really appreciate uh, this podcast is a welcome respite from the solitary pursuit of woodworking, like having some buddies in the shop with sound advice, sage wisdom, and friendly banner. Okay, occasional snarky remarks and jabs. Every episode adds to my knowledge and enjoyment of the craft. Yes, thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, and if you want to give us a little hand, a five-star review on iTunes really does help. Uh, spread the word. So, uh, any recommendations? I, I have one. What's yours? Don't buy a bicycle at a grocery store. Buy a bicycle at a, gr at a bike shop. Huh. What do you buy at the grocery store? Groceries. Okay. I've had nothing but bad experience buying bicycles at grocery stores, and I bought a bicycle at a bike shop yesterday, and it was amazing. Yeah, so. support your local bike shops for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right. Anybody else? Nope. Yep. Go ahead. You know you. Um, when you're mixing um, shellac with alcohol, um, look for the alcohol um, at your home center hardware store in the green labeled 
can. I think it's clean strip and it's got this more environmentally friendly denatured alcohol. You cannot drink it, but it is less bad for you than the typical alcohol because they control the amount of the nasty version of the alcohol in there. So it's slightly better for you. Does it smell as good? It all smells good. Denatured alcohol reminds me too much of Jägermeister, which reminds me of bad decisions. Every time I use every time I use shellac, I'm like 24 and on a bad path. <laughs> Maybe stick to a white pump poly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. I have I have a recommendation. There are five things. You can save money on things all of all of all all the time, all over the place, but don't cheap out on paint, haircuts, charcoal, shoes, and mattresses. Paint, haircuts, yeah. charcoal, shoes, and mattresses. Hundred percent agree. Which would, one of us did she look at when she said haircuts? I would add sandpaper. Because we to that to that sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> sandpaper too. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Knives, <laughs> kitchen knives, toasters. Oh, I have... heard about your toaster on the last <laughs> podcast. I think. Yeah. If you... <laughs> if you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into Shop Talk at Taunton.com. You can use the voice memo app on your phone and send us an email. Or you can leave a voicemail by calling 203-304-3456. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. Sushi. Don't buy cheap sushi. No. Yeah. That's a bad idea. <laughs> That's good advice. Yeah. In my defense, I knew somebody once who super glued fake eyelashes onto her kid's eye. <laughs> <laughs> onto her kid's what? On her kid's eyes. Onto the eyeballs themselves. She super glued fake eyelashes onto her kid's eyelids. Wow. For a costume for something. She didn't realize the nature of super glue, apparently. Well, it's so friendly looking. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny little bottle. The, the smell is so annoying. Also, because it's like crazy glue with a K, right? Yeah. I mean, how is that not fun? <laughs>